I'm going to be talking about uh, some issues with mo trying to model uh, analogy in artificial intelligence and how we might go forward to make progress. So way back in 1955, there was a famous uh, uh, proposal for a workshop on AI. This was uh, proposed by, as you can see, some of the pioneers of artificial intelligence, where they proposed a two-month study of uh, how to make machines uh, intelligent, including these topics, making machines use language, form abstractions and concepts, solve kinds of problems now reserved for humans, et cetera. Okay, and this in particular, forming abstractions and concepts is something that has, I think, gotten less attention in AI than it should have gotten. And we've really made, I would say, very little progress on how to get machines to form human-like concepts. So I'm gonna talk about what I mean by that a little, a little bit later. Now, AI has made enormous progress in the last decade. You can see here, here's a plot of this famous ImageNet image recognition competition. The error rate of the best program at each year in this competition just keeps going down and down and down. And you know, this, this is um, since uh, 2012, these uh, points are all deep neural networks getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Okay, and this uh, red line is sort of human level on this task. But the question is, what is it exactly that these machines are learning? You know, we've seen this kind of improvement in vision, in language, in robotics, in speech recognition, all, all over the place. But it's a little bit hard to understand exactly what these machines are actually learning. So some people have tried to probe the generality of these machines. So for instance, this is a paper that came out a few years ago where a group took a robot and put a camera on it and had the, the robot move around a, a house taking pictures of ordinary objects. And you know that ImageNet are photos that are downloaded from the web. So the question is, if you take pictures that are downloaded from the web and also pictures that are taken in a more sort of realistic setting, will neural networks be able to generalize from being trained on web images to these same categories, but kind of a different perspective on the images. And they showed that if you train on images from the web and test on images from the web, all these different deep neural networks get very high accuracy but if you train on images from the web and test on images taken by the robot, the accuracies plummet. So somehow these, this incredible performance on this particular web-based data set is not generalizing to performance on the same object categories, but taken in a very different uh, way. And we've seen this many, in many different examples. This group took images that were correctly classified by deep neural networks, say with 99% confidence, and they photoshopped them into different poses. So here we have fire truck, here we have the neural network, 98% confident that this is a school bus, 98% confident this is a fire boat, a bobsled, et cetera. So somehow these neural networks are perceiving something very different than what we humans perceive in these images, even though they're um, matching or exceeding human performance on standard uh, benchmarks. Related, a related uh, probe, a, gr uh, a group took a, a neural network that was trained using um, deep reinforcement learning on this Atari video game called Breakout, where you hit a little ball with a paddle and um, it collides with bricks and you get points for different levels of bricks and you move this paddle with a joystick. So, so this deep neural network learned how to play this game even better than human players. That was part of DeepMind's um, study before they did AlphaGo. But what happens, this uh, group, probed if you move the paddle up a few pixels. 
can the machine that was trained to play this game now play this very small variant? And they showed that it was not able to transfer what it had learned to this variant of the game, which is very unhuman-like because we humans, learn, when we learn a game like this, we, get, we have concepts like paddle, ball, brick, etc., And we can use those concepts to flexibly adjust our strategy from this variant to this variant Whereas this machine didn't seem to have actually learned those human-like concepts. We've seen this also in the, the well-known adversarial attacks on computer vision systems. This particular attack uh, caused a deep neural network vision system in a self-driving car to um, perceive these stop signs with very carefully placed stickers on them as speed limit 80 signs. So what is it that these machines are perceiving in these images and how is it different from what humans understand? Well, there's this notion of perceptual categories versus concepts. And it seems that neural networks, when they're trained on these images, you know, millions of images, say from the ImageNet set, are really learning what we would call perceptual categories, which are very different, I believe, than what we call concepts, which is what the brain or humans, the human mind is able to learn from its experience. So let's just give a, an example of that. Think about the um, category of bridges, okay? So we could probably train a neural net on many different pictures of bridges, and it might develop a great ability to distinguish bridges from other categories. But what humans are able to do that machines still cannot do is to abstract that category almost in, uh, in, in an infinite number of variations. So here's one example that I was very taken by. This is called a water bridge. So there's a highway running under this um, river and the engineers built this bridge for boats to go across the highway. Uh, it's not a standard idea of a bridge. A neural network trained on those earlier bridges probably wouldn't recognize it, but we humans are very easily able to understand this sort of variation of the notion of a bridge. We can also make sense of the idea that ants can build bridges out of their bodies to move from one surface to another, or that we can bridge our hands or the notion of the bridge of your nose, or a bridge of a song. So we take these perceptual categories and we're able to uh, enlarge them in a semantic abstraction to create rather abstract concepts like bridging the gender gap, or bridging from a brownie to a junior Girl Scout, or Biden, who says many times that he's the bridge to a new generation of leaders. And you can take any sort of perceptual word like this and show how it can be abstracted in these ways. And this is really very much at the core of, of human intelligence, I believe. You know, we can just go on and on. There's all kinds of abstract notions of bridges. And this, I, this is really what underlies Hofstadter's view that analogy is really the core of cognition and he defined a concept as a package of analogies. So that's very different from a perceptual category where we're able to have some space of say like ImageNet has a thousand different categories and you can divide up the space in some high dimensional vector space but it's too easy to go from one part of that space to another as we saw in my examples earlier. Whereas a concept is a much richer kind of um, entity, cognitive entity. So how is it that we can get machines to learn concepts rather than perceptual categories and to make these kinds of analogies that underlie human ability for abstraction? So that's something that I'm, that I'm interested in my own research. But I started looking at, um, some of the more recent ways in which people have approached this idea in artificial intelligence using idealized domains. So what I'm going to talk about in the rest of my talk is some of these idealized domains, including um, 
some popular uh, domains for studying abstraction in humans as well as machines. And then some selected AI methods. So um, these include symbolic approaches, deep neural networks, Bayesian program induction or rule induction, and I'm going to talk a little bit about, about my own work on copycat. And then ask, what is it we need to do to make progress in this area? Okay, so probably many of you are familiar with this set of problems, the Ravens progressive matrices. This is kind of a classic old IQ test that people have been applying for, I don't know, many, many decades. The idea here is that um, you have these little figures, this array or matrix of figures, you have eight of them, and then a blank space and you have to say what's the figure of these multiple choice answers that fits the best here. And there's different kinds of attributes like filled in versus striped versus uh, unfilled or shape, the kind of shape it is and so on. And you can see that um, if you just look at it for a little while that the best answer is number five, you know, as the completion. So Raven's progressive matrices you know, and you, there's lots of examples of them. I won't go into lots of details, but you get the idea. They've been said to be highly correlated with human intelligence. Okay, that's why they're used as IQ tests. I won't go into whether or not that's a reasonable thing to say, but for whatever reason, these uh, problems have become recently quite popular in AI as challenges for machine intelligence. So I'm gonna talk about two approaches to Raven's matrices. There was a recent paper about 10 years ago from um, Ken Forbes's group. Uh, probably a lot of people here are familiar with uh, the Gettner and Forbes approach, the, the structure mapping engine approach to analogy. So um, their group looked at trying to apply structure mapping to Raven's progressive matrices. And I'm gonna use this SME approach as um, kind of a, example, an illustrative example of a, a more symbolic approach and then contrast it with a neural network approach. So what SME does is it has as its input some kind of vectorized images that are pre-segmented into objects. Okay, so it doesn't even have to extract the objects. That's not part of what it's trying to do. Uh, sorry. Another program from the same group called Cogsketch is able to generate predicate logic sentence descriptions of each image. Like here's an example of um, the kinds of uh, predicate logic statements about each uh, image in this, um, e each little figure in the matrix. So this sort of logic representation is very important to this program. And then SME basically looks at all possible pairs of descriptions in each row and tries to match them up and returns the highest scoring mapping between descriptions for each pair. Um, has a repertoire of possible changes that can be made. Um, sorry. Um, and then tries to map patterns of change in the same way it tried to map, uh, map different uh, attributes of figures. And then it takes each possible answer to compute the pattern of change and compares it to some generalization and the highest scoring answer is selected. Okay, so that's just a really brief sketch of what it does, but you can see it's a, a sort of symbolic representation that is then used to do some kind of semi-exhaustive uh, search between possible matches using the, prin the principles of structure mapping, which say that you know, higher order relation matches uh, are preferred. Okay, so the system was run on a um, subset of the um, standard progressive matrices tests. They were, un they were less interested on programs that focused on what they called perceptual ability rather than analogy. And it was impressively able to solve 44 of the 48 problems it was tested on. Okay, so that's one approach. Uh, it has some limitations. So what I'm gonna do is go through 
the different approaches and talk a little bit about what I think the limitations are. Well, it relies on largely fixed representations of situations. Uh, once the cognet, the, uh, sorry, the, the, um, uh, the cog sketch program creates its representations, those remain largely fixed. There can be little tweaks to them during the mapping process. And also, uh, everything is represented in a rather, what I think of as a rigid predicate logic representation. That is, you know, there's attributes, there's relations, there's second order relations, and so on. And I can go into more detail why I think that's uh, uh, rigid and, and why that creates a problem. And also a semi-exhaustive search over possible matchings. So I think it's a good question of whether this could scale to more complex situations, even in the Raven's progressive matrix world. Okay, a very different approach has been taken by a number of groups in the last couple of years. This paper from this year called Solving Raven's Progressive Matrices with Neural Networks is one example. So the idea here is instead of, it's almost the polar opposite of the SME approach. There's no symbolic representation. Everything is uh, encoded as the weights of a neural network. Okay, so the idea here is now the input is going to be 16 images, these eight images from the original matrix and then the eight possible answers as um, regular uh, images, you know, bitmap images. And then a convolutional neural network. There's different neural networks that they tried, but in general, uh, the idea was to use convolutional neural networks to develop representations of, of these figures and to learn from many examples to map these 16 images to a probability distribution over the eight possible answers. Okay. So unlike SME, where there's no notion of training, you know, there, there's kind of a built-in set of repertoire of, of possible descriptions of, of the uh, images. Here, of course, there's no built-in prior knowledge. So the system had to learn and it had to learn from here, in this case, of uh, many tens of thousands of training examples. Okay, well, where did they get all these training examples? Well, they had to generate them, you know, Raven it, back in, it, it, you know, in the early part of the century created 60 problems. Well, this group came up with a grammar where they were able to stochastically sample from the grammar to create any number of possible problems. So the grammar here, for instance, you know, we have an inside structure and an outside structure. The outside component is in the center. Uh, it's, you know, only there's only one outside component, whereas in the inside there's three of them. And anyway, at, at each point in this tree structure, you have to sample to get a particular problem. So they were able to sample this stochastic grammar and get an infinite number of possible problems. And their results, so they, they tried on a lot of different methods. And this is the accuracy on average for different kinds of problems. And you can see that with um, these ResNet um, convolutional network architectures, they were able to get, er, very high accuracy, in fact, higher in some cases than the humans they tested. Okay, but the question is, what does these machines learn? And another group found that there was actually a bias in their um, grammar that, that, that caught, allowed the machines to take a shortcut rather than learning to actually reason about these problems. So the bias was that in order to develop to, to create the answer array, the array of possible answers for a problem. They took the correct answer and they changed one attribute per answer. So if this is like a, a pentagon, they changed the shape for one answer, they changed the color for another answer, they changed the size for another answer and so on. So each answer was created by changing one attribute, but you can probably see that 
that results in a possible shortcut, which is I just look at the answers and I take the maximum, the vote I vote among the different answers for each attribute, like shape, most of them are pentagons, color, most of them are black, size, most of them are large, you know, and so on. And that gives me the correct answer. And in fact, when they, this group tried to train on the candidate answers only with totally ignoring the context matrix, they were able to do as well as the ResNet. Um, so this was kind of a disappointment. This group created a new data set, a new way of generating these problems, but I'm not sure if it might not have its own biases. Okay, so the deep neural network limitations here, well, it requires a very large corpus of training examples, so you need to generate them automatically. And the trained networks are not very transparent. Without some kind of afterwards analysis, it's not clear what they learned um, and whether they're actually using the kinds of reasoning that we think needs to be, you know, shows a kind of general ability or not. So they're susceptible to shortcuts. Okay, so I'm going to talk about also the Bayesian rule induction. That, that was an approach applied recently to Bongard problems. So I don't know if this audience has, is familiar with Bongard problems or not. They, they were, they're a set of concept formation problems that were uh, proposed by a Russian computer scientist in this uh, in, in the 60s in, in a book about AI, where he said this was a good challenge for AI. The idea is you have six boxes on either side for each problem, and you're supposed to um, determine what's the um, attribute that all of these boxes share versus the attribute that all of these boxes share. So here it would be large versus small. And there's other attributes that are to be ignored, like the shape or the color or the position. But in other problems, you know, it's the color that matters or the orientation or the position in, in the square. And the Bongard proposed 100 of these problems and other people have proposed more. Some of them are pretty subtle, um, like this one, where the idea is that this side has, as in Bongard's words, all the figures have a neck. So here's, here's another kind of abstraction, the abstraction of a neck. This has a little neck, this has a little neck, this doesn't, these don't have necks. Okay, so it's a, a kind of a concept that you come up with on the fly to describe these. And in this one, um, if I was giving this talk in, in, in person rather than virtually, I'd ask you all to guess what the answer is, but unfortunately I can't do that. I'll tell you instead that, you know, here we have horizontal versus vertical necks. Okay, that's probably not a concept you thought of before, but you can recognize it very easily. Twins versus not twins, or same versus different. Inside versus outside. Here's outside, inside. This is something we see very easily, but you know, clearly there's, these aren't closed figures, literally, because we have all these spaces in between the little circles. Three versus four kind of in a very abstract way. Um, so the Bongard problems are very interesting and subtle. And this group in 2018 wanted to apply Bayesian rule induction, which is related to this other area in AI called probabilistic programming to solve the problems. So this is also a, a non neural network approach where um, the, the authors determine a grammar for possible rules. So here we have some, a lot of prior knowledge, kind of like the SME approach to Ravens, where these are all the concepts that the authors thought would be re relevant to, Bongard pro to at least some of the Bongard problems. I'll show you how they use a grammar to in induce a rule. Um, so this is a sort of written by the authors and then the induction method is, okay, um, use some kind of computer vision method to extract objects and figure out their shapes and their colors and so on. 
and then say we're going to use this Bayesian method where if, if E is the left and right image sets, G is the grammar, R is a rule, Bayes' rule says that the probability of the rule given the grammar and the images can be factored as the probability of the images given the rule times the probability of the rule given the grammar. So that's proportionality, if you know Bayes' rule. And now we can figure out what these two probability distributions are. Well, according to the authors, they define the probability of the images given the rule is one if these images are compatible with the rule, other, zero otherwise. The probability of the rule given the grammar, this is the prior, this is the likelihood. This is higher if R is concise, where concise has a meaning. Um, you can kind of intuitively say if it's short. Um, and use these constraints to create these probability distributions over possible rules or programs. Okay. And then sample programs from this distribution until a compatible rule is found. So, um, so you can imagine starting with this, you know, R left uh, goes to the start symbol, start symbol goes to there exists something, L, L can go to all of these. So you sample from this grammar to create these rules until you find something that's compatible. And their method was able to deal with, given their limits of their comp initial computer vision method, they, they could only deal in principle with 39 problems. And using this method, they solved 35 of them. Of course, this has a lot of limitations. You need a lot of built-in primitives and this sort of grammar. And there's also a rather ad hoc definition of the prior probability and likelihood distributions. And it requires a lot of search. So they had to sample about 300,000 different rules or programs per problem. Okay, so there's, there are ways to, to deal with the, this search problem, but we still have the, the issue of how do we decide what primitives to build in. And it's not clear, again, that this can scale easily to more complex problems. Okay, so I, the, the third um, domain I want to talk about is the copycat domain, which is something I worked on back in the 80s and 90s, um, developed by Hofstetter. So this is these letter string analogy problems where um, you have a source situation or letter string and tar uh, change, and then you have a target where you want to apply the analogous change. And these, these are quite open-ended. You can think of lots of different possible ways of changing these, uh, make, making these analogy problems interesting. The idea is that these are now, these letter strings are idealized situations. They have objects like letters or groups of letters. They have relationships between the objects, uh, grouping, different groupings, different possible actions, that is these changes or events that can happen. So they, they actually can get quite interesting and, and subtle. They were Hofstetter's sort of, it, he was first interested in building a machine that could solve the Bongard problems, but he felt that was too difficult to start off with. So instead he invented this letter string domain as trying to capture some of the same really interesting subtle issues about analogy making. So it's meant to be a general tool for exploring analogy. So my role is building this copycat program, which was an architecture for solving analogies like this, where the program included a workspace, kind of a short-term memory, where the problem was actually, the representations were built. It had a network of concepts. That's its permanent knowledge about the letters, like that B is the successor of A and that there are things like sameness groups and so on. Um, it had perceptual agents, which were little pieces of code we called codelets that um, took concepts from the concept network and tried to instantiate them in this workspace in order to make sense of the problem, like grouping 
letters or relationships. So this is sort of the permanent knowledge. This is the short term memory in which these structures are being created. And finally, a temperature which controlled the randomness or the determinism with which these perceptual agents acted and fed back to when um, this, the system felt it had built a lot of useful, good structure, the temperature got lower. So I'm going to show you a, a little movie of Copycat in Action. This is actually the Medicat program written by Jim Marshall, which is an extension of Copycat. So you can see um, what I'm going to do is um, you're going to see some of these codelets trying to build structures in this workspace and watch the temperature, which starts out very high. So these things are kind of random. You can think of them as sort of uh, almost like uh, eye movements to different parts of the analogy problem. The darkness of the line is how certain the program is about the structure it's trying to build. You can see as structures are built, the temperature goes down, which makes the system much more deterministic and focused on certain concepts like groupings. So here it's quite focused on the grouping structure here. And also the successorship structure here. So it's able to make a successorship grouping out of the whole thing. Here it is able to determine that this was a reverse direction of the string. And so it reverses the direction of the group. So copycats is a dynamic program. It's not like a feed forward neural network in which there's no feedback. Here we have quite a bit of feedback, but we also have some symbolic knowledge about the, the domain. Okay, sorry. So some important ideas from copycat that I want to, to point out is this notion of dynamics that we're continually integrating top down processes from, from the concept network, like saying grouping is important, and bottom-up processes that are trying to instantiate those concepts in the actual analogy that's being worked on. Unlike SME, in which there's a representation building process followed by a mapping process, here we have representation and analogy, anal anal analogical mapping being interleaved. And um, there's a continual integration of our, the prior knowledge that's built into the concept network with bottom up perceptions and context. And that's all controlled by the temperature. The temperature allows this sort of emergent transition from a very random bottom up oriented mode of processing to a much more deterministic, serial, attentive mode of processing. So this was inspired quite a bit by um, ideas from cognitive science and uh, pre-attentive versus attentive modes of uh, perception. But copycat was interesting, but it has a lot of limitations. Its architecture is fairly ad hoc. There's no sort of um, elegant mathematical framework like there is in like Bayesian uh, program induction. It's not clear how general the architecture is. Um, and the concepts are given, they're not learned. Well, that's been true for some of these other um, methods, but the neural network method, everything is learned from many, many training examples. Okay, so I wanted to just, as my last domain, to talk about this proposal by um, a Google scientist named Francois Cholet. Possibly some of you have heard about this. He wrote a really interesting paper called On the Measure of Intelligence that tried to say, how is it that we're going to measure intelligence in artificial intelligence systems? You know, we have the Turing test, which has all kinds of flaws. We have other, you know, these language systems like GPT-3, which sound intelligent, but actually have all kinds of strange uh, sort of cracks in the facade, if you will. So his proposal was something rather like the copycat program, except in a visual, much more visual system. So he, ha he, he has this, um, what he calls the arc corpus, the uh, abstract, re abstract reasoning corpus that he proposed, um, hand-built, not generated, 
So here's a, he has these tasks. Okay, so a task is, uh, consists of a few examples where you change one uh, uh, sort of array of um, pixels to a, another. So here we change this whole thing to this, or this whole thing to this, or this whole thing to this. So you can see, you know, here the colors are going horizontally, so we change it to a one-dimensional horizontal color array, and here are the vertical. So now, do those do that same analogous thing to this new test one. So that's an example of a problem. He he invented, I think, something like a thousand of these, and they're all they're they're really interesting little visual analogy problems. I won't go through all of them. Um, this is sort of a above versus below kind of problem. So he had a training set of 400 of these so-called tasks, or I would call them problems, and then a hidden evaluation set, where hidden means no one had access to it but him, okay? And he set up a Kaggle challenge. So Kaggle is this website well-known in machine learning where um, you can set up a challenge. There's usually a prize money. Um, there's a leaderboard where people can submit their programs. And um, there was a three month challenge for solving these programs. And, and they, people could train on these 400 examples that were released, but they were then tested on these. They, they had to submit their programs, which were then tested on these 600 test examples. And the best programs solved 20% of the test cases. But he told me, Chalet told me that um, the, the programs weren't released. So I don't know exactly how they worked, but he told me the winning entries were brute forcing a handcrafted search space. So they weren't very general. So it was a little disappointing. So the question is now that I actually want to have a discussion about is how, is how is it that we can make progress on this question in AI? You know, we have these idealized domains. There's many, many more that I haven't told you about that um, people have proposed and have tested their own method on. So we have all these separate efforts going on in these different domains for studying this, these questions. So I think there has to be, instead of having a single group working on a single domain presenting the results, we have to have systems that really can be generalized across different domains. So we need something like a generalized suite of challenging tasks to foster progress on this topic. This is something that people have done in the natural language processing community in AI, where there's a um, kind of a common suite of tasks. There's maybe 20 different tasks that or domains that people apply their programs to and then are evaluated. Um, the advantage here of idealized domains is that we can really be quite explicit about what prior knowledge and assumptions are needed. Rather than having an open-ended domain like analogies in language, which I find to be kind of difficult to assess, like if a program can make analogies between stories in natural language, we often anthropomorphize what a system has achieved because we, we sort of assume that it has understood in some sense the language that it's being used the same way that we understand it. But I think that's a danger that we have to avoid. And to avoid that, we can use these very um, idealized systems in which it's very explicit what is known and what is understood and what is not. There's also an issue with evaluation. As you could see in, in these different methods I, I showed, the evaluation was always how many problems did it get correct on this kind of static, often a static test set? So we need evaluations that aren't static, that can't be kind of gamed in the way that we saw with the neural networks. We need changing evaluations, I believe. And also the evaluation should be based on several factors. And here's some of the factors that go beyond accuracy to generality, that is performance across different tasks, the ability to generate answers rather than simply recognize solutions like in, 
you know, Raven's problems, you had to choose a multiple cho from multiple choice. You didn't have to generate your own answer. So I think that allows shortcuts. Also, we should prevent this ability of like neural networks to train on tens of thousands of examples that are similar to the examples they're going to be tested on. So in, in AI, people talk about low shot learning. That means learning from only a few examples. I think that's absolutely essential to avoid, you know, cheating in some sense, you know, the ability to abstract with only a few examples. Robustness to modifications in tasks. For example, suppose that I have a Raven's problem that, that is trying to um, explain the idea of monotonically increasing. Okay, that's an co abstract concept. I should be able to go in and, and test little modifications of the problem that still captures the um, semantic idea, but make sure that the system is robust. And there's been a lot of examples showing that systems that have learned in one kind of training set are not very robust to modifications. Like, you know, one great example was that breakout game where you just move the paddle up by a few pixels. And also scalability to more complex examples of tasks. So these are all evaluation metrics that go to the, showing the system's ability, but I also feel that these systems need to be able to be explained. They have to explain their reasoning. You know, sy symbolic systems like uh, SME or, or copycat are able to show sort of exactly how they mapped one uh, situation onto another. But neural networks are less explainable. We don't know how they did the task. So we need to measure, evaluate based on how explainable the system is. So a lot of these same ideas are, I wrote up in a paper I recently published um, in AI Magazine about um, a workshop we had on what we call crashing the barrier of meaning in artificial intelligence that is trying to get machines that actually understand what um, the data that they, they, they um, are working on. And also in my recent book. Um, so hopefully these, uh, the, the, this review and these proposals have engendered some questions. I'd really be happy to have a discussion with all of you. So thanks for listening.